All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Duncan, um, and I'm a librarian with Peace Library System. Uh, today's session is all about horror in the library. This is kind of a reader's advisory webinar on horror fiction. So we're going to go over a whole bunch of different things. We're going to attempt to define horror. We're going to go over the history of horror. We'll take a look at um, some of the most popular subgenres and trends and some of the current top modern titles in those subgenres. Uh, we'll end with looking at some readers advisory tools we can use, including Novelist, which uh, PLS has access to. And before we begin, I'm going to do a land acknowledgement. Peace Library System acknowledges that we are located on the Treaty 8 territory of the Cree, Beaver, and Diné people, and Region 6 of the Métis Nation of Alberta. We are grateful to live, work, and learn together on this land, which has been home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples since time immemorial. We recognize this land as an act of reconciliation, and we also commit to supporting and celebrating our local Indigenous communities while working to break down institutional barriers to make our libraries equitable, and accessible. Now, if I had an audience, and I don't have an audience, I'm recording this uh, solo today, but if I had an audience, I would ask you, what is the scariest book you've ever read? So something to think about as we go through this and uh, think about where it might land in the subgenres that we go over. But I think it's important to have sessions like this where um, all we do is recommend titles and we immerse ourselves in the world of a genre. Um, there's going to be a ton of authors and a ton of titles that we go over, and I'm hoping that by the end of this, you're going to have an arsenal of recommendations and a little bit more context to uh, the entirety of the horror genre. Now, Novelist, which we'll look at later, Novelist actually did a study with library workers, and horror was the fourth, fourth most feared genre for readers' advisory. And this was behind uh, Westerns, uh, Christian fiction, and uh, in first place was science fiction. So horror is a, is a genre that can cause fear in, in those who do reader's advisory. Um, and it's hard to do good reader's advisory if we don't know where to look or if we are unfamiliar with the genre. Um, and it's also, it's close to Halloween. This is a great opportunity just to geek out on horror. So to begin, let's take a look at what horror is and why do people like it? Is it all just blood and monsters? Now, horror actually falls under the umbrella of speculative fiction, which can be described as any genre that deliberately departs from realism or from imitating ordinary reality to instead uh, present supernatural, futuristic, or other imaginative realms. So these are kind of our uh, three genres within uh, the umbrella of speculative fiction. We have science fiction, uh, you know, what if our scientific theories are real? Fantasy fiction, what if magic or magical creatures exist? And then horror fiction, which is what if our nightmares are real? Now, many people will define horror fiction as stories that are meant to evoke a feeling of fear or dread in the reader. But as we go through, you will see that this isn't always the case. So I, I would try to think about it more abstractly under the speculative fiction umbrella, as there's going to be um, horror that has lots of fantasy elements or horror that has lots of science fiction elements, there is some blending between these three genres. Okay. And then I also put these, uh, these are kind of what people think about when, uh, when they think of horror fiction. Now, why do readers like horror? Um, and this can go beyond fiction, right? This also includes film and horror podcasts and any other kind of horror media. But there are a few different reasons. One is to experience stimulation, right? The exposure to terrifying acts or the anticipation of those acts can uh, stimulate us both mentally and physically. And it's fun, right? Uh, another is to experience unfamiliar experiences. So this by reading horror fiction, it allows us to live out alternate realities. So things like apocalypses or alien outbreaks. Uh, and then lastly, uh, it helps to satisfy some of our uh, dark curiosity, the dark parts of the human psyche. So in real life, we may not have the, the opportunity to experience these horrors, but we as humans are fascinated by, 
by what we are capable of. So reading horror allows us to experience that. Uh, now, because horror does give readers pleasure, um, in order to possess a psychological protective frame that allows us to derive pleasure from actually being scared or horrified, um, there are three frames in which we as humans can enjoy horror. Uh, the first is the safety frame. So in the safety frame, we believe that we are physically safe, um, which brings pleasure, right? There's no immediate danger to us. If we believe we might have harm done to us, well, then it's no longer fun. The second is the detachment frame. Um, so we were able to psychologically detach from a horror experience. And we know that, you know, we can think in our minds that a bloody scene in a movie is not real. And we can remind ourselves that it's just actors or that a scary scene in a book is actually fictitious as it is written by the author. Um, and then the third one is the confidence in control frame. So this is viewing the horror experience as something that we can control and manage. Um, so thinking to ourselves, I could easily outrun that zombie. Or, well, if I was in this situation in a haunted house, I would just leave, right? We can put ourselves in these situations and we know we can give ourselves confidence that we would make the right decisions. Now, there is a misconception that all horror is um, scary or gory or really intense. Um, and that's not true, right? Horror is as broad uh, a genre as any other, right? You want to uh, laugh at spooky things? Well, there's a whole genre of horror comedy. Um, thrillers often use horror elements to make the real world more palpable. Um, sometimes books are categorized in the horror genre just because they feature typical horror creatures such as vampires or werewolves or ghosts. Uh, so something like Hotel Transylvania. Um, other styles of horror, like gothic, um, are less about blood and guts and more about atmosphere and mood. And I have a couple um, just examples here on how far the spectrum of horror is. So for book-wise, we could think of something like the Bernstein Bears Trick or Treat book as being on the, the low end, and then American Psycho by Brett Easton Ellis as being, uh, you know, very intense and very scary. And then for film... We have Hotel Transylvania, which is uh, obviously very horror coded. We have lots of classic horror monsters like Frankenstein, it's a monster and the mummy, uh, vampires. And then, of course, on the other end, we have something like Saw, which is very um, graphic, gory and intense. All right. We're going to spend some time going through uh, the history of horror and its rise to popularity today. So the next few slides are going to reflect uh, horror trends at the time, which is interesting to see how horror evolves from generation to generation. So it all begins in 1235. So in 1235, the Vatican issued an order to reestablish the orthodoxy of the faith, meaning that any, any charges of heresy were uh, tangled up with allegations of witchcraft. And this obsession with witchcraft would endure until the 17th century. So witches and the dark arts were kind of the origins uh, of horror and kind of the scary trend at the time. In 1307, this is kind of our first uh, major horror fiction release, uh, Dante published the first volume of the Divine Comedy, uh, also known as Inferno. And it was this vision of Satan that Dante presented that would be very um, influential in years to come. Over the next century, works of hor horror would still lar largely be tied to religion. Sorry, I'm battling with a little bit of a cold. Um, but in 1486, Henry Kramer and Jacob Springer published uh, The Hammer of Witches, which certainly contributed to the witch craze that continued to grip the next two centuries. Okay. Uh, by the 1580s, a new whole kind of horror had come, uh, and that had come to the London stage. It was gruesome plays. Um, and when I say gruesome, I mean that there was murder and plotting in the plays. So the series of gruesome plays began with Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy and included um, Shakespeare's Hamlet and Macbeth, 
and then also the John Webster's The Duchess of Malfi. In the 18th century, a significant amount of horror fiction of this era was marketed towards a female audience, with a typical scenario being um, resourceful uh, females ill-fated in a gloomy castle. In 1765, Horace Walpole published uh, The Castle of Otranto, which is considered the first Gothic novel. And this book would have an incredible impact on the emerging genre of horror. Um, it's the story of a prince who is really keen to secure the castle for his descendants in the face of a mysterious curse. In 1796, Matthew Lewis published uh, the novel The Monk, and this was an early example of masculine or the horror gothic, and it covers many shocking and depraved themes, including the downfall of the, the monk Ambrosio and his interactions with a demon who is in disguise. And then in 1797, shortly after The Monk, uh, Anne Radcliffe published her terror gothic novel called The Italian. And it's kind of viewed as the feminine response to Lewis's uh, novel. And uh, The Italian contains a plot of a mother who is plotting to prevent an unwanted marriage. It's very dark and grim. In the 19th century, the first half was when Gothic fiction really took over modern readers and became the top genre. Uh, by the second half of the century, historical fiction was kind of more in vogue at the time. Um, 1818, Mary Shelley originated the genre of science fiction, which again falls under the speculative, speculative fiction umbrella. Uh, and she did that with Frankenstein, which also heavily influenced the horror genre. Um, John William Polidori established the vampire subgenre with The Vampire, which was published in New Monthly Magazine. And we'll talk more about um, magazines and short story uh, horror in a few slides. But these two stories were actually the result of the same contest that Shelley and Polidori took a part in, among other writers at the time. And they both came out with both heavily influential uh, novels. However, Edgar Allan Poe would bring the Gothic tradition to America, and his first story, um, MS Found in a Bottle, or Manuscript Found in a Bottle, appeared in the Baltimore Sunday Visitor in 1833. Uh, and the plot of this involves uh, a narrator at sea who, who finds himself in a bunch of harrowing circumstances and as he nears his own death while his ship drives, you know, further and further away, he writes uh, a manuscript telling of his adventures, which he then casts into the sea. And then, of course, Edgar Allan Poe um, went on to produce some of the world's most outstanding macabre tales and has been called uh, the father of the de detective novel. Good. In the 19th century, we also start to see um, horror adjacent uh, children's fiction during this time. Um, so modern readers are you know, scandalized by the gruesomeness of um, Grimm's fairy tales and uh, the grisly details that are portrayed in fairy tales told for children by Hans Christian Andersen. So it might not seem uh, very scary to us in modern day, um, but at the time this was quite uh, quite scandalous. All right, in the early 20th century, we start to see pulp magazines emerge to give uh, more genre writers an outlet. So writers like H.P. Lovecraft, Ray Bradbury, and Robert Bloke, among many others, published stories in magazines. And by this time, the short story had definitively replaced the novel as the modus operandi uh, for most horror writers. 1907, Algernon Blackwood published The Listener, um, which is a collection of stories, and it contained his most highly regarded short story called The Willows, which is really kind of scary sounding. It's an, an epic uh, about a canoe trip down the Danube River. However, the main characters come to, um, in quotes, a region of singular loneliness and desolation, unquote, where willow-covered islands grow and shrink overnight uh, amid the rapids. Uh, 
very scary. Seems to be on almost a stuck in limbo type situation. Um, in America, though, horror was flourishing. In 1923, the first issue of Weird Tales appeared. Um, the magazine actually never turned a profit in its 32-year run, but it did feature a number of still famous authors like H.P. Lovecraft and Ray ba Bradbury. Um, four years after that, uh, of the first issue of Weird Tales, Lovecraft published The Call of Cthulhu which earned him critical acclaim and recognition as one of the preeminent horror writers of the era. And for those who are not familiar, The Call of Cthulhu is about this cult that worships Cthulhu. And Cthulhu is this monstrous human octopus dragon hybrid that lives in a sunken city. And Cthulhu's dreams influence uh, reality. So it's very, uh, very strange. Um, but the turn of the century also saw the first experiments with horror film, which tended towards um, the gruesome and fantastic side of things. And the first true horror film was actually a 16 minute uh, adaption of Jekyll and Hyde. Um, and then the movie adaption of that would actually appear later uh, in 1910. And uh, Thomas Edison actually worked on on that film, which is kind of interesting. All right, the late 20th century is where we start to see the real life horrors of World War II and the looming paranoia and menace of the Cold War, uh, which ushers in a new generation as horror novels gain um, mainstream acceptability. Um, so the very real war, uh, horrors of World War II overshadow fictional ones. Although Ray Bradbury and a few other significant authors continued publishing horror stories and science fiction, but it wasn't really until the 1950s that uh, horror hit a stride. And in 1959, Shirley Jackson uh, published The House on Haunted Hill, which remains one of the most critically acclaimed genre novels of the past 60 years. Or I guess it'd be longer than 60 years, 70 years. <laughs> Uh, in 1959, Robert Bloke's Psycho was published, which was inspired by the Ed Gein story. And this book would pave the way for works like Thomas Harris's Hannibal, uh, or the Hannibal Lecter series, sorry. And uh, the serial killer um, has since become a very popular archetype for the genre. Uh, the Cold War also ushered in a new age of paranoia and just fear of invasion. And these fears were uh, realized in works like Ira Levin's uh, Rosemary Baby, Rosemary's Baby, which came out in 1967. Mm. So now we're getting into the late, late 20th century, which is when Stephen King arrives. But the 1970s saw uh, a deluge of horror novels um, perhaps epitomized by Stephen King's Carrie, which came out in 1974. And Stephen King, you know, burst out not only into the American horror scene, but into kind of the international or larger world of literature. We also start to see books by Clive Barker, who is a London playwright, and his short story collection, The Books of Blood, which came out in 1984, marked a new age of horror in the UK and Europe. And he has remained an influential figure, um, pushing many boundaries of the genre and fueling lots of discussion on how the genre should be defined. By the 1990s, we get to a time of compromise and self-consciousness for the genre. Um, and the 90s also brought us R.L. Stein's Goosebumps series, which was the publishing phenomenon of that decade. And I love Goosebumps. <laughs> And then we get to modern horror, where we start to see authors like Joe Hill. Uh, and Joe Hill is actually Stephen King's son. He took uh, Hill as his last name to try and make a name for himself without King. Um, Stephen King also has another son named Owen, who is also a writer, although I don't think as prolific as Joe Hill. Um, but more recent notable releases include uh, a Head Full of Ghosts by Paul Tremblay, and really anything by Grady Hendrix, but uh, the Final Girls support group is in there. 
and it did not come out in 1797. That is a typo. <laughs> Um, but I won't show too many current titles here because we're going to have plenty to see in the subgenre section. And this is just a slide of some notable 21st entry, 21st century horror authors um, to know, right? You might even recognize a few of these names, but this would be a slide um, to save if you're just looking for some current authors that you can recommend. All right, so let's now go through some of the most common subgenres and the trends and the tropes that are kind of interwoven with each of them. So on each of the next slides, I've listed some common tropes for each of these subgenres, as well as some notable modern recommendations that can be used for patrons or for yourself, right? And they're good ones, I've read a few of them. So many people are introduced to horror with ghost stories or the tales of a haunted location. It's oftentimes the lore, you know, the horror lore that we are exposed to as kids. So some recurring characteristics include, um, you know, the main conflict of the story must be resolved so that the ghost can be at rest. Um, using ghost sightings as a metaphor for internal feelings. A lot of these times they play on the fear of you know scary or unknown things that go bump in the night but ghost stories appeal to readers because they a help to affirm a belief in life after death um there is a psychological aspect of figuring out the spirit's motivation and the main character secrets and also the the ghost story setting like haunted houses are are a big draw to readers right it's fun um but these are some modern recommendations. We have Mexican Gothic, uh, The Deep, Kill Creek, and The Grip of It. Um, and I'll go through one on each of these slides so that we're not here forever. But I'll, I'll recommend The Deep. And The Deep is um, about a character named Annie, who is a stewardess on the Titanic. And she is experiencing unexplainable circumstances and thinks she is being haunted. Another insanely popular subgenre, uh, as we saw in the history section, is vampires. Um, and there is not as definitive a list of common characteristics as other subgenres. Vampires tend to differ from title to title. Some have fangs, some have uh, a bigger attitude than others, some of them sparkle. Um, but there are some common tropes like the need to drink blood, the avoidance of the sun, etc. But again, those are not always present. Um, vampires appeal to readers because of the immortality aspect. Um, you know, the idea of living a separate life is really appealing. There's also a certain romanticism to vampire fiction. Um, some modern recommendations include the Southern Book, the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires by Grady Hendrix, uh, A Small Charred Face, in the Valley of the Sun, and The Quick. And The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slain Vampires. Uh, this is a book set in the 90s about a woman's book club that must protect its suburban community from a mysterious and handsome stranger who turns out to be a blood-sucking fiend. It's very exciting. Zombies. So the modern zombie is more heavily based on the Night of the Living Dead film by George A. Romero, as opposed to the voodoo-based origins of zombies. Um, there is a surprising amount of zombie fiction that's out there. Um, characteristics of this include um, the living dead coming to life, um, walking around looking for brains, um, can only be killed um, by destroying the head, Oftentimes, there's a lot of uh, virus origins with the zombies. But zombies appeal to readers because it acts as a sort of escapism to our current stressful political and economic climate. Um, right? We can think things are bad, but they could be worse. We could be infested with zombies. And zombies are also funny, right? They appeal because um, they're like a parody of ourselves. 
Um, but some modern recommendations. Uh, I am a hero, which is actually a manga. So it's like, uh, like a typographic novel. Uh, Husk, Dread Nation, and the Reapers are the Angels. And in Husk, uh, the character Charlie Husk is a cannibal. He's a member of a clan of flesh eaters who live hidden away from the world. And Charlie's job is to travel into civilization, abduct people, and then bring them back to the clan. But when he falls in love with a human girl, his whole life changes. So it's an interesting way of approaching zombies in uh portraying them as kind of like a cannibal and is are they really human are they not all right which is in black magic the so tales of witches have of course spanned across history as we saw very early in the history section there have always been uh individuals in, in any culture that can harness the power of magic and that could be very scary um there's also supernatural horror where the evil um, magic is not based on a witch-like character. It's more like an evil object or something. But in witch fiction, um, some common characteristics include, um, you know, curses or uh, a certain intelligence or mischievousness. Oftentimes, witches are separate or cast away from society. Um and witches appeal to us because, um, you know, historically we have an obsession with persecuting those accused of witchcraft. Um, you know, organized religion, as we saw, has villainized witchcraft. And also because powers and magic are, are just really exciting, especially in uh, a modern setting. But these are some recommendations. Uh, Hex, Bone Set and Feathers, The Toll, and the bright lands and hex i've actually read hex and it's an excellent book uh hex is about a small town in north america that is haunted by a witch with her eyes and mouth sewn up and if opened uh a nightmare unleashes so the witch is heavily monitored in the town by surveillance cameras um, as she appears in random locations throughout the day just kind of in a limbo state just standing there so she could appear in your living room uh, or you could wake up and she's in your garage for a little bit and then she disappears somewhere else in the town uh, and it's about how the town manages that uh that curse all right monsters now monsters can be you know maybe they're newly born or maybe it's an ancient evil that is rising again um a lot of the monster subgenre has obviously been influenced by Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, as well as really early monster movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon and Godzilla. Oftentimes, uh, monsters have a basis in folklore, um, or there's like a lifelike discovery. So the, the books will include scientists to show that this could really happen. Um, and there's also a lot of... Uh, an isolated location setting in monster fiction, which enhances the fear and makes it more believable, um, right? So the main characters can't get away. They have to stay and confront the monster. But monster fiction appeals to readers because it plays with the reader's psyche. Uh, the monsters enhance our own internal struggles and it conceptualizes us into a monster. It becomes like the, the physical manifestation of an emotion. And they have a tendency to be quite bloody uh, and readers like that so these are some picks we have the only good indians uh the ancestor the monster of ellenhaven and children of chicago and in the only good indians uh four men from the blackfeet nation who were childhood friends find themselves in a desperate struggle for their lives against an entity that wants to exact revenge for what they did during an elk hunt 10 years earlier. And this is a very popular book that came out in uh, 2021, I believe. All right, nature horror. So threatening animals or scary animals is something that we can all relate to. I mean, I always get scared going hiking because of bears. Always bring bear spray. 
But in that way, nature horror can be very realistic, which can be very appealing to readers. However, the horror element in nature horror tends to come from something unexplainable. So maybe it's a zombie bear or a killer plant that's following you. Um, a simple wolf attack would not fit the definition of horror as much as a werewolf attack might. Um, but nature horror appeals to readers um, because it's of the natural world. It's something we can relate to. And it reminds us that we will never completely reign over nature. So books like The Ruins and Eden, uh, I recommend Paul Tremblay's Survivor Song and also Devolution by Max Brooks. And in Survivor Song, the plot centers uh, upon people who are struggling to survive um, while a highly infectious virus decimates uh, Massachusetts. Um, and this book, um, fun fact, was published shortly after the COVID pandemic began. So it kind of had, um, I don't know if like unfortunate or good timing, like it was uh, maybe didn't do as well as it could have because the the contents of the book were too eerily similar to the contents of everyday life. All right, the devil and demons, of course, has origins in religion. Um, you know, there's always been stories of an underworld king or some kind of anti-god that exists. So we're going to see things like demonic possession, satanic rituals, selling your soul to the devil is a very common characteristic. Um, but readers like um, demons and the devil because it plays on the human fascination with life after death, right? The, the religious aspect attracts a lot of readers. It also becomes, uh, the books become a safe space to explore really dark parts of humanity. Um, and explore how easy it is to succumb to evil. So some modern modern picks would be things like the Goddess of Filth, uh, Temper, uh, the Demons of King Solomon, which is a short story collection, and the Devil of Echo Lake. And in the Devil of Echo Lake, um, it stars Billy Moon, who is a rock star, and he is in search of a transcendent record. So he comes to Echo Lake to pursue that goal, um, led by a producer who might be the personification of Satan himself. All right, psychological horror. So this is horror that actively plays with the mind of both readers and characters, um, very disorienting and twisting, but it's important to make the distinction from psychological to suspense where in psychological suspense, uh, the monsters are 100% human-based. In psychological horror, uh, you know, monsters or whatever the horror is uh, could include supernatural or otherworldly elements. So again, psychological horror, some common trends. Um, it's usually centered in the real world. There's often a lot of parent-child relationships that come into play. Lots of themes of obsession are also very common. Um, and also this kind of found footage uh, theme, connecting terror from the past or, or finding something from the past and being scared of it now. Uh, but we have some picks, uh, Little Darlings by Melanie Golding, Inspection, Height of Stone, and The Shining Girls. And Inspection, um, Inspection contemplates a dark experiment aimed at improving intelligence by separating boys and girls. Um, if boys and girls can be reared without distraction, the theory go goes, then each group will have more time to develop their genius. So the book um, goes on about this experiment and kind of what results from that. All right, we got two more subgenre slides. Cosmic horror, um, which you will often hear referred to as Lovecraftian horror, refers to things like alien monsters and horror in space that is beyond our comprehension. And that's what makes it terrifying. 
um, monsters that are indescribable to human minds. H.P. Lovecraft originated the genre with the Cthulhu mythos, um, but many authors have gone beyond that and used his ideas as a jumping off point to create monsters beyond our comprehension. So you're going to see a lot of nihilism, uh, insanity, uh, the existence of other dimensions in cosmic horror. And it appeals to us because, you know, humanity fears otherness. We also fear being othered. Um, so things we can't explain, things we can't describe are, are huge fears to humans. But these are some picks. We have The Fisherman by John Langan, uh, Lovecraft Country, The Hollow Places by T. Kingfisher, uh, Agents of Dreamland, and The Fisherman. I've read The Fisherman, and I, I highly recommend it. It's a very good novel. Um, but The Fisherman is a story about two men who have both lost their families, uh, the narrator Abe and his friend Dan. And it's about uh, them finding comfort and connection in fishing. And then it takes a really strange turn for the unnerving, um, as in they're seeking a remote fishing spot they find way more than they could have ever imagined. Um, the story has a very unique structure going into it. It's almost like um, a story within a story. So be wary going into it, but it is a, a very, very good book. And our last subgenre we're going to talk about is body horror. And this, of course, focuses on um, graphic and psychologically disturbing mutilations of the human body. So stories that use the human form to create feelings of dread and anxiety. Um, and it appeals to readers because, you know, it's a universal experience. Everybody has a body. Um, there tends to be a lot of puberty-based horror in body horror. So physically transforming the body um, and pregnancy, right? Something growing inside the body. So some recommendations would be books like uh, A Bot, Tender is the Flesh, Her Body and Other Parties, and Lakewood. And I've read Tender is the Flesh, and this one, uh, you, I, I put a warning here because it is it, quite intense, but Tender is the Flesh portrays a society in which a virus has contaminated all animal meat. And because of the lack of animal flesh, um, cannibalism becomes legal. And the main character, Marcos, is a human meat supplier, and he's kind of conflicted about this new society um, and tortured by his own personal losses. It's not a very long book, but it is quite um, disturbing just in concept and content. So I recommend it, but be warned. And now, now is a good time to think about what your favorite horror subgenre is, or maybe one that you're interested in exploring a little bit more of. If I had an audience, we would talk about this, but again, I'm recording this solo today. All right, we're going to end with going over a few reader's advisory tools to use. Um, and just things to think about when we are doing reader's advisory for patrons who are looking for horror fiction. So award lists are really good ways to keep up on um, new popular horror fiction. It can also be really helpful for collection development and just keeping you know up to date on new releases in general. Um, so things like the Shirley Jackson Awards, which are presented annually for achievement in uh, literature of psychological suspense, horror and dark fantasy. Uh, the Bram Stoker Awards, which are presented by the Horror Writers Association. Um, and this is actually what the award looks like. It's like this little I don't know if it's a haunted house or a castle, but the door opens. And when you win the award, you can open the door and it has engraved what you what you won it for. Um, the World Fantasy Award, which are speculative fiction awards. Um, so again, this might also include some sci-fi and fantasy picks. So although not directly horror, there are many horror fiction titles that are nominated and win each year in the World Fantasy Awards. So, for example, in 2021, um, books we, we went over, Mexican Gothic and The Only Good Indians, both horror novels, were nominated uh, for this award in 2021. And this is what the award currently looks like. 
It used to be, up until 2015, the statue of H.P. Lovecraft. But H.P. Lovecraft was kind of um, a racist and uh, a sexist, right? Like, he he's maybe not the best guy. So we've kind of put him to the side and created this um, moon and tree award in its place, which I think looks a lot better. And then, of course, Goodreads always has um, a consistently updated horror new releases page um, that you can check out. But any of these, you can just go to the website um, or type these in on Google, and you will find current nominations uh, and nominations from previous years. But when we're doing Reader's Advisory, we want to make sure that we are doing, um, when we're doing our reference interview, rather, with patrons, um, that we're assessing the limits of the patron. Like, what is what is too much horror and what is not enough? So kind of similar to how we would check a romance novel's uh, heat level, we're doing the same with horror. Now, of course, you haven't read every book in the library, um, but we can use reviews of titles to help direct what the actual content is like. So if we're looking at a review for a book and it's being described with words like atmospheric, creepy, or gothic, it's going to have a tendency to be on the lower level of horror. Mid-level books are going to have words uh, describing words like dread, menacing, unease, frightening. Uh, High-level books are going to have things like intensity, uh, terror, visceral, violent, unflinching is another word that is used very often. Um, and the word bleak is is put in between mid and high level because it has a tendency to go back and forth between the two. Sometimes we get requests for titles that seem like an oxymoron. So, for example, I love The Walking Dead and I want to read something similar to The Walking Dead, but I don't like zombies. Okay. Um, so... The patron has an interest in horror material, but when we break it down, it's not the horror that they're interested in. It's it's the trope or the theme. Um, so for someone who likes The Walking Dead, um, they might be more partial to books that have a band of survivors trope as opposed to a zombie trope. And the band of survivors trope does not necessarily mean horror, right? So they're picking out um, an element from this horror TV show that they like um which is the band of survivors and we can recommend horror books that have this trope or we can recommend other genres that also have this trope okay so we just want to be aware of that um to look outside of the genre for recommendations because just because you're given a horror title to help with your reader's advisory service doesn't mean that everything you present needs to be horror related it could be general fiction um you know it could be romance it could be anything but I'm going to show you how to do this in Novelist, and then that'll be it. So Novelist is a really good way uh, to conduct reader's advisory. And you can get there on your library website. Um, I'm using the PLS website. And we're going to click on e-resources. And I'm going to scroll down all the way to Novelist Plus. There's also Novelist K-8, to uh, but Novelist K-8 to restricts books for... Um, a zero to 12 age audience. So we're going to do Novelist Plus because it includes everything. It's going to ask you to sign in with your library card. Um, didn't ask me because I'm already signed in. But I'll show you a few different ways that we can go about doing Reader's Advisory for Horror. From our main page here, if we go up to the Browse By tab and we go down to Themes, this brings us to our Explore Themes page. And if I scroll down a bit, and they've changed this up recently, but if I click on Theme Index, this is gonna bring me to an index of all sorts of different genres and the themes that are found within those genres. So for example, horror, they've kind of sorted them by character, monsters, plot, setting, and style. Um, but you can click into any one of these. So, for example, we were looking at Band of Survivors in uh, zombie fiction. And when I click into that, it's going to bring up 
a list of every book and novelist that has Band of Survivors listed as a theme. And you'll see right away the top one is Nora Roberts. And Nora Roberts is not someone who we would typically associate with writing horror fiction. So I'm going to assume this is not a horror book, but it has the Band of Survivors theme. Right? So this one, maybe The Last Kids on Earth. Maybe it's a younger patron who likes The Walking Dead. This would be a great recommendation for them. Uh, on these book pages, when you click into a book page on Novelist, it's going to give you all sorts of information here. So description, genre, you know, pace, tone. You even have horror listed as a genre. But if you go to the bottom of, the, of these books, so if someone came in with this book and they said, I love this, I want something similar, but I only like certain parts, you can scroll down to the bottom and you can actually select what you like about the story and then search within Novelist for books that have those similar subjects or similar um, themes. So if I like this title, but I only like the fact that it has monsters and that it's post has a post-apocalypse setting, I can choose those two, hit search, and it'll bring me up a list of, and of course, these are all The Last Kids on Earth <laughs> books, but here we go. Here's a few more. So it brings me up a list of books that have uh, those same similar subjects or themes. Um, if we also go up to Browse By, and instead of themes, we go to Award Winners, um, this is going to list a whole bunch of popular fiction awards. But again, if you're looking for just more ways to keep up to date on horror releases, we can click on Horror under Awards by Type. And this will list all of the different um, horror awards. So we talked about the Bram Stoker Awards. There's, you know, an award for your first novel. There's an award for graphic novels. There's an award for young adult novels. And it'll tell you the winner of it. And then looks like this one hasn't updated yet, but it'll have a link to the winners from those years. And you can read more about it. The last thing I'll show you in Novelist, um, again, we're going to go to, sorry, Quick Links down to Genre Guides. And these genre guides are great because they're going to give you a really in-depth analysis of a particular genre, sort of like the subgenre section in the slides. Um, but some of these are horror or horror adjacent. So for example, if I scroll down, looking for this one, Gothic Fiction for Adults. So it's giving me, and these are written by novelist staff, but it tells you exactly what gothic fiction is. And this is a subgenre we didn't really go over in the slides. It tells you some common themes within the genre, why readers like it, again, why, why it appeals to readers, some uh, important uh, titles that are within the genre, Mexican Gothic, we also saw in our uh, ghost slide. Some key authors who continually publish Gothic fiction. Um, foundation, so earlier works. And just more information. And then I like this at the bottom. It gives you some fun searches to try that are related to that genre. So if you want to look at historical Gothic fiction or uh, diverse Gothic fiction, you can click on one of these. A novelist will present you with a list of everything that is tagged with that particular uh, subject, so historical Gothic fiction. But that is it. If you have any questions about horror fiction or reader's advisory, um, of course, I'm a fan of horror fiction, feel free to uh, give me a phone call or you can send me an email at dlatoski at peacelibrarysystem.ab.ca. And yeah, thanks everyone. Hope to see you at the next one.